Well, good morning. How many of you would say, I love road trips? How many of you love road trips? Yeah, wow, that's a lot of us. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, and those of you at the factory and the warehouse, our friends up in Churchill, uh, anybody w- live streaming or watching online, uh, we want to include you in that as well as we kind of think about road trips, and that's really where this series is coming from. Uh, you were either a kid driving in the back of a car, uh, being the one asking the question, are we there yet? Or you've got kids asking that question. And so we're asking that question spiritually. We're saying, what does it take to move us down the road of faith? When will we know that we're there? Will we ever get there? And what does that look like? How do we grow our faith and how do we, we advance our faith? So we're spending four weeks looking at the elements of the forces that help to grow our faith. Now, so let me take you back to 1943. 1943, the Allied forces had a problem. Uh, too many of their airplanes were getting bombed down and getting shot down. And so they realized they needed to do something about this problem. So they said, you know what, we're, we're going to add some armor to our airplanes. Uh, the problem is you can't just add armor to a whole airplane because it'll get too heavy and, and be too hard to maneuver and it'll get you know, uh, vulnerable and shot down. So you have to be strategic where you add armor to an airplane. So the people that were in charge of this, uh, they did a whole bunch of studies and they examined all the airplanes that came back uh, and they, they tracked all the bullet holes. And uh, so they came back and they had these files and they had photos and they had data and they took all these files, photos and data to a nerdy statistician, uh, a Jewish immigrant from Austria who had moved to Colorado and then moved to New York City, was working for the War Department. He was a doctorate in mathematics. Uh, His name was Abram Wald and they took us to to Abram Wald and they said, uh, Dr. Wald, where should we add the, the armor to our airplanes? We got all this data, we got these pictures, and here's where all the bullet holes have been on our airplanes. And so what we're thinking is, and they took a pen and they said, we're thinking we should add armor to these areas where the most bullet holes are. But we just need your expertise to tell us whether we should do that. And so Dr. Wall took a look at all the photos and uh, he, he took a pen and he said, actually, I'm thinking you should add the armor to these spaces. And he circled all the spaces that had no bullet holes. And the officer scratched her head and said, that's ridiculous. Why, why in the world would we add armor where there are no bullet holes and leave the planes vulnerable? He said, well, the reason you want to add the armor here is because your data is from planes that have returned from battle. So I have a question for you. Where are all the missing bullet holes? He says, I'll tell you where the missing bullet holes are. They're on the planes that didn't survive and have crashed. In other words, your data only shows where the planes can take a bullet and survive. We need to add the the armor to where a plane takes a bullet and can't survive. And this was like an aha moment for all these guys. They were sitting there going, oh my goodness, that is so counterintuitive. I never saw that coming. That's unbelievable. And so what we're going to do is is we want to study some things today that are counterintuitive. I love the idea of of counterintuitive. This was brilliantly counterintuitive. You know, when I think of counterintuitive, I I think of an old house that hasn't been, uh, nobody's got into it for like like 60 years, and it's got dusty windows and and doors, and and suddenly somebody breaks into this thing and opens up the windows and opens up the doors, and, and sunlight streams into where there's only been darkness. And, and the, the dust all gets blown out, and the stale air is replaced with fresh air, and the cobwebs that have been silently growing there for 60 years suddenly get blown away, and it feels like there's new life in this old house. And I kind of think of, of counterintuitive thoughts that way, that, that we have one way of thinking, and then this counterintuitive thought comes along and just opens up the house, and this fresh wind comes in. It's a different way of thinking. 150 years ago, uh, the British were colonizing India. Not a great move at all. However, when they got there, uh, they went to Delhi, and, and there was cobra snakes all over the place. And apparently, the British don't like cobra snakes. So they were freaking out, and they were saying, we got to do something about this problem. So somebody came up with a brilliant idea. They said, why don't we offer money um, for the cobra snakes? So if you bring us a dead cobra snake, we'll give you money. Very soon, everybody was smiling. They thought this was a brilliant idea. So the British were were no longer seeing cobra snakes around Delhi, and the people that lived there were pocketing pocketing this money, and they they were making a little bit extra money, which is great. But very soon, some entrepreneurial thinking people came along, and they began to breed cobra snakes in their houses. 
And so now they were breeding hundreds of cobra snakes so that they could take them to the British and cash in on money. And when the British realized what was going on, they canceled the cobras for, for money uh, program, and now the cobras were worth nothing. So you know what they did? All the people just said, well, these things aren't worth anything, so they let them go in the streets. And now there was more cobras in the streets than there were before. And this has come to be known as the cobra effect. When, when one of your solutions or ideas of how you're going to fix something actually turns out to be worse than it was at the beginning and has a detrimental effect. It's counterintuitive. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go on a bit of a journey and we're going to dig into the Bible and we are going to study some concepts that are counterintuitive, some concepts that when you first read them don't make any sense at all. You sit there and go, that is so backwards, that, that way of thinking. So last weekend, uh, Pastor John launched our series, Are We There Yet? And he said, listen, one of the forces that grows your life the best is other people. He took us to Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. And he did this whole teaching on how we sharpen one another's lives. We make each other better. We take each other down the road of faith. And he said that happens when we become vulnerable with each other. That happens when we become intentional with each other. And it happens when we recognize our differences and we actually allow those differences to strengthen our lives. Great teaching. Uh, it was a teaching that kind of took us to a place that basically said, look, it, when you let other people into close proximity and you unzip your soul and you become vulnerable and you intentionally invite people to speak into your life, you're going to grow. You're going to grow your faith and you're going to grow your life. So if that was John's kind of an understanding of what takes us down the road, then, then what I want to present to you today is going to at first sound ridiculous. It's going to sound like that is so backwards, that doesn't actually work. But we're going to study our way through it, and I'm going to show you that these principles will actually help grow your life. Now, uh, we're going to dig right into the Bible, and we're going to take a look at James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. It's a fairly familiar passage, but I want to give it a fresh look, and we're going to read through it together. So James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. If you're keeping paper notes, that's great. If you want to go on our Riverwood app, we have a notes page and all the Scripture and fill-in-the-blank opportunities, because I think there's some phrases we're going to use today that you're going to want to remember and take with you. So I encourage you to, uh, to take some notes. James 1, 2 to 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. It's a sheer gift. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing." Now, if I was to do a little survey, sit down with you, have a little conversation and say, listen, tell me, list for me all the elements in your life that bring you joy. What do you consider to be a gift from God right out of heaven to your life? Uh, you know, what, what floats your boat? What's, what just sort of expands your faith? What excites you as a person? My guess is none of you are going to have on your list uh, troubles and struggles and conflict and failure and pain. Yeah, that would be it. No, you're going to sit there and go, that, that's not even going to make the list. And yet, look at what James says. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for pure joy or a considered a sheer gift. That's absolutely diametrically backwards for how I live my life and for how most of us live our lives. It doesn't make any sense on the surface. You know, we don't celebrate our, our failures. We don't celebrate pain or take joy in pain. This is completely backwards. So what I want to do today is I want to give you some, some principles because, you see, this whole idea of, of embracing our problems and our struggles, as James says, to me, I sit there and I go, you know what? I'll tell you how I feel about my problems and struggles. I hate them. I hate pain. And the only thing I hate more than pain is failure. I'm terrified of failure. And I really do not like problems and struggles. In fact, if they made a problem and struggle repellent, I would buy it by the caseload, and I would spray it on myself every single day because I just would want to repel those things because I do not like problems, struggles, pain, or failure or discomfort of any kind. And yet here's James saying, hey, you want to know how to grow your life? You want to know how to increase your capacity of faith and your personality and your character? 
I'll tell you how. Become friends with your problems. When you see a struggle or a problem in your life, look at it and say, wow, that's a gift. Throw a party and celebrate the problems and struggle that come your way. See them as great joy. When James says that, I say, that does not make any sense. That makes no sense to me at all. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you three counterintuitive uh, principles or truths, and, and we're going to flip our perspective today, and you're going to feel the fresh wind come into your soul as we flip our perspective on problems and trials and issues. Now, the first one I want to give you is this. Write this down. Conflict is the prelude to intimacy. Conflict is the prelude to intimacy. Now, most of us are allergic to conflict. I really do not like conflict at all. I try to avoid it. In fact, conflict, for most of us, we look at it, we say, wow, that's a cancer in our relationship. Our relationship has conflict, and and conflict is the cancer that's going to end up destroying this relationship. However, conflict has a tremendous ability to improve us to expand us, to enhance us, and to strengthen a relationship if experienced properly. In fact, conflict, and you need to begin to see conflict this way, is actually the gateway or the prelude to closeness, to a better relationship, to intimacy. Before someone shared this little gem with Carolyn and I about 20 years ago, we used to... uh, of, of, you know, kind of get into conflict, and we would see it as a war. We would see it as a tug of war. We would see it as something I need to convince and conquer her, and she need to, needed to convince and conquer me. And so we had this tug of war, and, and the one with the best words and the, the strongest emotions and the loudest voice and, and maybe the tricky tactics would be the winner. That's how we often kind of come to conflict. Most of us, we know that conflict when you walk into conflict, it feels like you're walking into a completely pitch black tunnel or cave. You walk in there and you know there's another person in there, but you're not sure where they are. And you have no idea what weapon they're holding or what they're willing to do to take you down. So we walk into these conflicts defensive already. And we're not sure when the first blow is going to come. And often what we'll do in a conflict is we'll end up sort of swinging and and flailing, trying to inflict some wounds on the other person before they even get going because that's the idea of walking into one of these pitch black caves of conflict. And we take out all these weapons and we use really strong words so emotions begin to rise and volumes and anger erupt and the volume escalates to shouting. Yeah, well, you, you never keep a budget. Well, that's because you're always so controlling. I couldn't keep a budget because you'd never listen to me. Yeah, well, all you ever do is think of yourself. Oh, I think of myself. When's the last time you ever bought me something? You know my love language is gifts. You haven't bought me anything. Like, you, you're so selfish, you just think of yourself. And, and it just gets volleying back and forth, back and forth. And if that hit a little close to home, I mean, we could do about, you know, 100 other examples because we all have them, don't we? Uh, of just how these things escalate out of, out of control. And so when I experience something like that, I, I, I never sit there and go, wow, that was a gift. That was sure joyful. That was fun. Wow, well, let's do that again. And the reason is because we end up doing conflict wrong. We do conflict wrong. And the Bible says, look it, do conflict, but when you do conflict, do it right. In fact, Paul in Ephesians, listen to this. I love this. He says, when you're doing conflict, banish bitterness, rage, and anger. Banish shouting and slander and any and all malicious thoughts. These, those things are poison. Instead, when you're walking into one of these black caves, be kind and compassionate. Graciously forgive one another, just as God has forgiven you through the anointed, our liberating King. In other words, when you walk into one of these conflicts, and you will walk into a conflict, in one of these black tunnels of conflict, when you walk in, instead of grabbing your weapons and getting all defensive, instead, pick up a torch. Pick up a torch and begin to to shine some light into this thing. Be smart about it. I I love how how one uh, relationship therapist, Dr. Ellen Batter, she says this, in a conflict situation, you need to change your perspective from furious to curious. Well, you know what? 
we got to take that with us. We need, that is so counterintuitive. Walk into a conflict situation. The next time you find yourself in a conflict situation, instead of being furious, be curious. Pick up the light. Begin to shine it. Say, hmm, so we're having some tension around money. Uh, help me understand where, you know, where did you get some of these ideas? Why, why do you have some of this, this emotion around that? What, what was it like when you were growing up? Where, where did this, this kind of fear of money come from? This seems to be an issue that, that really touches you deeply. Um, help, help me understand that. How am I coming across to you right now? Uh, help me understand. Get curious in these situations. Shine the light in these situations. I, I wonder what I could do to help this person feel more relaxed. I wonder why they feel so out of control and vulnerable right now. Get curious rather than furious. You've got to realize that when you walk into a tunnel of conflict, this is a gateway or an opportunity for you to experience much greater intimacy and much greater closeness if you will just simply do conflict right. Look, the conflict that's in your life right now does not need to be energy draining. It doesn't need to be a relationship killer. It is not signaling the end of the relationship. The conflict in your life right now is very possibly indicating the prelude or the beginning to even more closeness if you will work your way through it and you'll work your way through it in a right and proper way. Incredibly counterintuitive, but very truthful. Now, struggles and problems come to our lives, and they're not always in the form of conflict. Sometimes they're in the form of pain. And uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians has this great perspective on pain. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 4.17. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. You see, the short-lived pains of this life are creating for us an eternal glory. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today, gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever. I think Paul would say to us, pain is the prelude to strength. Completely counterintuitive, backwards thinking. We don't accept it when we first hear it, but it's that fresh breeze wafting into the old house of thought. Pain is only the beginning of connecting you to greater strength. Right now, inside of you, that discomfort, that agony, that hurt, that throbbing ache, whether it's physical, emotional, or psychological, it's not the end of you. Instead, you need to begin looking at it like a secret passageway to some brand new strength. That's what this passage says. It's a secret passageway to some brand new strength. But you might have to start speaking to your pain. Here's what I mean by that. There's a guy named Jens, Jens Voigt. He's a German cyclist, world-renowned um, master cyclist. He's in, uh, just this legend of a cyclist. Uh, he, he cycled the 23-day, 3,500-kilometer through the Alps uh, Tour de France numerous times, won lots of stages, set world records. He's been in every major cycling competition. Uh, he did this for 18 years. Uh, he's just a legend. And uh, a number of years ago, he actually retired after 18 years in, in 2014. Uh, and then three years later, 2017, he came out of retirement. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start raising money for cancer, uh, cancer research. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to Everest. He called it Everesting. Now, what that meant was basically he's going to ride his bike up Everest. Now, you can't physically ride a bike up Everest. But what he said is I'm going to climb in one ride the same elevation as Everest, 29,000 feet vertical elevation. And I'm going to take this challenge on for, for cancer research. So sure enough, on a winter day in Germany, he found a hill, and he said, I'm going to ride this hill uphill 100 times. He says, it should take me about 24 hours. It ended up taking him 26 and a half hours. He, ran, he, he rode for 400 kilometers straight. He had never in his life ridden that distance, not even in his professional career. And he just had to dig so deep, and he ended up raising uh, lots and lots of money for cancer research. The guy's a legend. But what he's most known for is one simple little phrase. And here's his little phrase. Shut up, legs. 
He would be riding on a, on a tour to France. He would be riding up a mountain. He would be riding someplace, and his legs would begin to burn, and they would begin to scream at him, it's time to give up. It's time to stop. We cannot take this any longer. And he was known for verbally out on the, on the track or out on the course, yelling at his legs, shut up, legs. It's only pain. It's only pain. We're going to push through this. We got a job to do. Shut up and do what I tell you to do. You see, Jen Voigt came to the place where he realized that pain isn't the end. In fact, pain is not even the supreme boss. Pain is a bully. Pain is a bully that loves to lie to you and, and wants to shut you down, wants to cause all sorts of burning and throbbing and exhaustion in you. And so he would yell, shut up, legs. We have a race to run. We have a race to win. This is so counterintuitive because pain simply sends one message to all of us, and that is, it's time to give up. It's time to stop. Just throw in the towel. You're nothing. You're not going to survive this. And yet, listen again with some fresh eyes to what Paul says. He says, so we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, there's a new work happening on the inside as we push through the pain. On the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without His unfolding grace. You see, the short-lived pains of this life are creating for us an eternal glory. There's far more here than meets the eye. Most of us are blinded by our pain to the point that we just simply think, this is it, this is the end, this, everything is downhill, it's, and it's not, it's a lie. There's far more here going on than meets the eye. And when we push through our pain... God unleashes new life on the inside. When we push through our pain, God fills us with, with what He calls fresh grace and fresh strength. And in fact, He even goes on to say, this, is, this pain is causing an eternal glory. We're here for a while, but there's an eternal glory if we'll just push through the pain. And I love how He says it at the end of this, there's far more here than meets the eye. Some of us are going through conflict, and some of us are going through pain right now, and we need God to remove the blinders so that we see with new eyes the potential and the possibilities. I know this is shockingly backwards from what we often think, but if we flip our perspective on this into the counterintuitive, we discover all sorts of brand new possibilities. Problems and struggles don't have to destroy you. They can grow you. They can help you. They can expand your life. Conflict is a prelude to intimacy. Pain is a prelude to strength. And finally, failure is the prelude to discovery. I really admire people who say that they aren't afraid to fail because if I was to unzip my soul, I would have to tell you that I am terrified of failure. I hate failure. And yet, James says, consider it a gift. Consider it pure joy. Consider it a gift when you experience conflict and troubles and pain and failure because these things produce inside of us. They are the force that produces inside of us endurance and tenacity and true learning. In fact, you cannot learn without failure. There's another James, uh, James Dyson, who 28 years ago was uh, vacuuming his house and his vacuum sucked. Well, actually, it didn't suck, and that was the problem. It wasn't sucking up very well, and James was an engineer, and he looked at this vacuum, and he thought, gee, maybe I could do something better here. So he went out to his garage, and he got some duct tape and cardboard and PVC pipe, and he started monkeying around with this stuff, and he put something together uh, called the cyclone technology, and, and gee, it, it worked, sort of. It worked, but it didn't really work. And so in an interview... Uh, he was telling the story, and he says this. He said, by the time we were having our third child, I was on prototype number 15. When I hit prototype 2,627, my wife was really counting the pennies because we were going broke. When I hit prototype 3,727, my wife was beginning to teach art lessons just to put food on the table. Finally, at try number 5,127, with 5,126 failures and 15 years of investing my life, I finally got it right. And I took our first vacuum, the DC-01, to market. 
In this interview, he says, now it's 15 years later, we just released the DC-35, and it's been another 15 years of trying something, failing, learning from our failure, trying something else, failing, learning from our failure, trying something else, failing, learning from our failure. James Dyson concludes the article entitled, In Praise of Failure, by saying, the North American education system and society in general frowns upon and even punishes failure. But failure is the key to discovery. Failure is the key to learning. And he ends the article by saying, I fail constantly, and I wouldn't have it any other way. So many of you know that I'm working on a, uh, a 45-year-old British sports car that I'm attempting to restore. Uh, it's been in my garage for four years. It's been a difficult project. I'm hoping to have it on the road this next week. And so yesterday I was just finishing up some of the interior. And about a year ago I, I sewed uh, the side panels and kind of liked how they looked. And, and then I ended up mounting them with contact cement on some thin plywood. And yesterday I realized that I needed to cut some handle holes in, in my door panel. And so I, I knew I needed to do this very precisely. So I went and, and I put a brand new uh, X-Acto knife blade into my knife and I laid it down on my workbench and took a deep breath and I began to, to slice the vinyl uh, where I thought the, the handle should be. And it was going fairly well, so I do, began slicing a little faster and, and in no time I was done. And I held the panel up and looked at it and thought, wow, I did a really good job. And then I looked down and realized that my other panel from the other door was laying underneath it, and it looked like a ninja had just cut, cut this thing all to pieces. And I gasped. I was in absolute shock. When you fail, you, you go into shock mode. And I was in shock, and then I was in denial. Somebody else must have done this. I, I couldn't have done this. What a rookie mistake. And then I became angry. I mean, all within about 10 seconds, I looked at this and thinking, this is crazy. How could I have done such a stupid thing? And so my other door panel's got all these slices in it, and, and then I, th I went into fix-it mode, right? And I thought, okay, I can fix this. I can fix this. I, all I need to do is go get some material off my roll and, and, and sew up another one. I went to the roll, and I'd used up all the material. So I had no more material. And, and then I went into shock again and denial and anger, and, and then I heard this little voice, consider it all joy when you fail. And I thought, forget that nonsense, this doesn't work. In fact, I had the serious thought yesterday morning, I cannot preach this message because it does not work in the moment. It does not work in the moment. This is not a gift. I am not joyful. I am very angry right now and I'm very frustrated. I'm very mad at myself and I feel like a schmuck for doing this. But an hour later, uh, when my emotions have settled down a little bit, I thought, okay, I've got to deal with this. And I thought there's only one way, and that is to actually fix the slice marks. And so I went to the all-knowing YouTube and uh, went to find out how do you fix vinyl. And then I had this little wisp of a moment thinking, wow, I can add to my resume of things that I can do, vinyl fixing, because uh, I'm going to become a vinyl fixer. And, and sure enough, I began to, to fix the vinyl. But in the process, some very interesting things happened in my heart. First of all, I felt a peace come over my heart, even though I was working with sliced up mistakes uh, secondly, not only along with the skill of beginning to fix this vinyl, I, I kind of got this sense that, wow, how materialistic are you? Are you, are you really materialistic where you have to have a car that's just perfect? Because you do know this thing's going to get dinged and scratched and, and it's, gonna get, it's, just, it's just tin and, and material, it's nothing. And I got this little shift of, uh, away from materialism. I thought, hey, this isn't such a big deal. And then I got this thought of, of the people at Riverwood that I know who are going through massive issues and massive pain and have made huge mistakes. And I'm thinking about them, thinking, this is nothing. Like, just right-size this thing. This is nothing. And about five hours after I had, had created this mess and made this mistake, I thought, hmm, this, this mistake was, was actually a gift. My life is better because of it. And I began to take joy, and I thought, hmm, maybe I can preach this weekend. Maybe I can teach them. Maybe it does, it does work. We just need to get the joy a little closer to the event. And so what I want to encourage you to do is, number one, talk to Jesus about it. Take your conflict, take your pain, take your mistakes, give them to Jesus. Some of you haven't had a conversation with Jesus for a long time or ever. And I want to let you know that he's just arms open wide. Let's talk about those things. And then, secondly, I want to suggest that maybe you and Jesus need to go and uh, talk to your conflict. 
And I think the two of you need to say, shut up, conflict. This is not the end, and this, this conflict is nothing to panic about. In fact, in this conflict somewhere is a secret passageway that's going to lead us to greater intimacy if we'll just do this conflict well. Some of you need to speak to your pain. And you need to say, shut up, pain. You're not the boss. I refuse to give up because I'm just on the other side of this pain is a whole new world of strength and resolve and character and endurance that God is going to give me, and I'm going to grow because of this. You are not the end of me. And some of you need to speak to your failures. Shut up, failure. Life isn't three strikes and then you're out. When I hit try number 5,127 like Dyson, I'll just beginning to, to learn and to discover things that I never knew before. You're actually the pathway to discovery and success, so I will walk with my head held high. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. It lands on our hearts, and at first we go, that's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. How could we ever rejoice and, and take joy in our, our, our problems and struggles and, and our conflict and our pain and our failures? How could we ever see those as a gift? And yet, if we will push through with You, we realize that these truly are a gift to making our lives stronger and better. And God, we thank You for the ultimate hope we have in You. For every day, every, every one of us in this, this room will eventually come to the place where one of our problems, one of our struggles, one of our pains, or one of our conflicts takes us down. But we have a hope beyond this life. These things are shaping for us an eternal glory as we put our trust in You. God, thanks for the hope we have, even in the face of conflict and pain and failure. In Jesus' name, and the people said, Amen. Amen. Everybody over at the warehouse and fire hall in Churchill, we bless you. We release you. Have a great week.